Hi, and welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. I'm Kira Smith, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Sarah Tulaney. Dr. Tulaney is hosting a live webinar for I3 Health next Wednesday, July 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, focused on triple negative breast cancer. And today she'll be discussing um, a preview of some of the topic, topics that will be covered in the webinar. I'm Dr. Tulaney, thanks so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. To start off, would you like to introduce yourself and what you focus on in your work with breast cancer? Sure. Uh, so my name is Sarah Tulaney. I'm a breast medical oncologist at dana Farber Cancer Institute and chief of the Division of Breast Oncology here. And my research interests have really focused on developing novel therapies for patients who have breast cancer. So really trying to move promising early drugs uh, into the clinic for patients so they get early access and really with the goal of trying to improve outcomes for patients, but also at the same time, trying to be very mindful of the side effects that these drugs cause and really want to tailor drugs to the individual patient. Great. So in the webinar next week, you'll be discussing the many important considerations in the management of TNBC. By way of background, what are some of the factors that make TNBC such a challenging disease to treat? You know, I think one of the challenges is we've sort of defined triple negative breast cancer by what it isn't. So we've defined it as a cancer that lacks estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. But in truth, you know, triple negative disease does have some receptors on it. So we've made it sound like it doesn't have any targets, but that's certainly not true. I think the other challenge is that triple negative breast cancer is very heterogeneous. It isn't really just all the same in all patients who have triple negative disease. And so, you know, I think we've come a long way um, from where we used to be, where we used to think again, that there was no target on triple negative breast cancer and that um, we really just had chemotherapy. But, you know, as this program will address, there are lots of novel therapies that really have come out that have changed outcomes for patients, uh, which is really important. Definitely. Um, so as you mentioned about these novel therapies, what are some of the most promising ones that have been developed over the past few years and how have they impacted treatment? So I think we've been really fortunate to see so many new drugs come out, particularly over the last two to three years. We've seen immunotherapy, we've seen PARP inhibitors, and we've seen antibody drug conjugates emerge. And so I think all of these have really had tremendous outcome. That being said, these agents are for specific subsets of triple negative disease. Just like we said, not all triple negative breast cancers is, are the same. And so it is important to understand the person's individual triple negative cancer and then figure out what therapy works for them. So for example, with immunotherapies, we've learned that if someone has metastatic triple negative breast cancer and that that cancer has the pdl one receptor on it, then immunotherapy when added to chemotherapy really does dramatically improve outcomes. So we need to know if the triple negative breast cancer is pdl one positive, which is about 30 to 40% of all triple negative cancers. Then for PARP inhibitors, we know that these agents work in patients who have germline BRCA mutations and that they have better disease control for longer in patients um, when compared to chemotherapy. So really important to know germline BRCA status, but it turns out they also work in patients who have somatic BRCA mutations or germline PALB2 mutations. So really important to understand um, this information in order to know if they're a candidate for PARP inhibition. Additionally, for antibody drug conjugates, we have sasituzumab govotecan and we have trastuzumab deruxtecan. Trastuzumab deruxtecan, though, at least for now, seems to work best in those patients who have what we call HER2 low breast cancer, meaning that the cancer has a little bit of the HER2 protein on it. It's not a cancer that's truly HER2 amplified and HER2 positive, but rather if you looked at the cancer, it's either one plus or two plus by immunohistochemistry and not FISH amplified, which is about a third of triple negative breast cancer patients. So I think as you can see, there are lots of drugs, but you do need to understand the individual biomarkers um, on that cancer as well as germline mutational status to be able to figure out what agent is the best choice for the individual patient at that particular time. Absolutely. It's great to hear about all the new options. Um, so what are some of the notable toxicities that have come along with these novel treatments and how do you approach managing them? Yeah, a very important question. And these therapies all do have different side effects that we do have to be mindful of. So for example, with immunotherapy, these agents are really looking to take the breaks off the immune cells. And so your immune cells then sometimes can get a little over revved up and potentially attack normal tissue. And this can cause an 
inflammation in that normal tissue. So for example, very commonly in breast cancer patients getting immunotherapy, about 20% of patients will develop thyroid toxicity, which you know is something we can monitor by checking thyroid function tests routinely when someone's getting immunotherapy and then institute um, thyroid hormone replacement, for example, if someone develops hypothyroidism. We also see that people can get other organs inflamed. And so the lungs can cause, you know, if inflamed can cause pneumonitis, the liver, you can get hepatitis, the colon, you can get colitis. Um, you can also get other endocrine toxicities, adrenal insufficiency, hypopituitarism. So all those things do need to be carefully monitored in patients getting immunotherapy. For PARP inhibition, the things to be mindful of are issues with nausea, um, which we can use antiemetics as needed, certainly. And then impact on blood counts with a particular impact uh, on the red blood cells. So we can see anemia, which sometimes can even result in need for transfusion in patients getting PARP inhibition. And so something again, to, to be tracking and um, monitoring. And then for antibody drug conjugates, there are some unique toxicities. You know, in fact, these are in truth chemotherapy agents. They are delivering chemotherapy. Um, so with sasituzumab, we do see that patients do lose their hair. Um, so alopecia, unfortunately, is very common. Um, neutropenia is common. About half of the patients getting sasituzumab at grade three, four neutropenia, and about half of them require growth factor support. Um, and mild diarrhea can also happen with sasituzumab, but as needed, lupiramide works very well. For TDXD or trastuzumab durextican, that agent um, can also cause some neutropenia. It causes less in the way of alopecia, so maybe about 20% of patients or so will actually completely go bald from using TDXD, but most people keep their hair. And then the one side effect that we do have to be mindful of with TDXD is interstitial lung disease or ILD, which happens at about 10 to 15% of patients. So it's important to let patients know that they could get this inflame, inflammatory kind of reaction in their lungs from TDXD, that they do need to look out for shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, cough, um, any type of upper respiratory symptoms, and that does need to get evaluated promptly um, if, if they do to, to become symptomatic from it. So again, unique toxicities uh, depending on which agent there is. Thank you. That was a great overview of all the all the considerations. Um, so looking ahead to the future um, of the therapies that are currently in development, which do you think will have the greatest potential to impact treatment in the coming years? Well, it's nice to see there are so many new agents that are in the pipeline uh, that continue to, to hopefully will continue to really impact outcomes for patients. So I think we touched upon two of the antibody drug conjugates, sasituzumab, gobatecan, and trastuzumab, durexacin, but there are other ADCs in development um, one that probably will hopefully come out more near term would be datapotamab deruxtecan or dato DXD, which is a trope 2 directed ADC, also with a deruxtecan payload, so very similar in that sense to TDXD, but instead with a different target. Um, and so this agent is being studied in the first line setting for triple negative disease. Uh, so hopefully um, that more to come. That study is currently enrolling. But we've already seen initial data that looks very promising in pretreated triple negative disease. There are other ADCs as well, uh, patritumab durextecan, which is a HER3 directed ADC, also with the durextecan payload, looks very promising as well in pretreated triple negative breast cancer. But I think this leads to the question of how can we have all these ADCs with somewhat similar payloads, especially if they're all targeting or having a topoisomerase one payload? Are they going to work one after the other? And we don't know, uh, we need more data here. Uh, and so I think that is going to be a question as these new agents really move forward about how do we sequence these drugs? Can you use them sequentially? What's the efficacy? And are there biomarkers that can help us predict which patients will continue to drive benefit as we better understand resistance um, to these drugs? Um, there's certainly other agents that are in development, including some targeted drugs um, like AKT inhibition, which we're, certainly, we're currently waiting on data for. Um, you know, and other novel immunotherapies are also in develop, development, things like TIGIT. Uh, and so I think, again, you know, more to come as um, these other agents move forward. Definitely looking forward to hearing more about um, all these trials as they progress. Um, so switching gears a little bit, since you're presenting the webinar next week, along with Dr. Ira Blyweiss, who is a pathologist, what are some insights that you have learned from pathologists over the years that have benefited your practice? One is how critical the pathologists are, um, which is, I think, even just becoming more and more important as time goes on, particularly not just to make a diagnosis of triple negative disease, 
But now as we're getting all these biomarkers, it is becoming very complicated. Uh, you know, with pdl one we've seen lots of different antibodies be used to test for pdl one And right now, since we're using pembrolizumab and pdl one positive triple negative disease, we have to use a 22C3 antibody and use CPS testing and get a score greater than or equal to 10 to make someone eligible for immunotherapy. And there's a lot of challenges with reading that pdl one assay. So um, really important to partner with your pathologist, make sure you're getting the right assay for the uh, checkpoint inhibition you're going to utilize. Then for HER2 testing, um, that's been really quite an evolving space as we now need to understand if someone has HER2 low disease. We never really thought about that before, uh, but now that is quite critical. And we've seen the challenges with reading HER2 low with um, really challenges getting um, concordance between pathologists really reading the same scoring. And I think this is going to evolve even further because we will soon better understand if patients can have ultra low HER2 status, meaning somewhere between zero and one plus, um, and benefit from TDXD, and maybe even eventually see if HER2 zero patients benefit from TDXD, uh, and will we need better quantitative assays? Um, so I think, you know, these are just two little examples of how complicated uh, testing has become in breast cancer and really how critical our pathology partners are. Um, so I think, you know, again, having a better understanding of these biomarkers is, is critical. And, and again, our pathologists play such an important role there. Absolutely. They definitely do. Um, so is there anything else covered in the webinar that you're looking forward to discussing? I think really the most fun that I have is trying to figure out what the right therapy is for the individual patient at that particular time. And so, you know, it isn't, well, we have all these pieces uh, and armamentarium, if you will, that we could utilize to treat the patient. You know, it does take understanding, you know, what exactly is going on with the patient at that time. Um, you know, how do they respond to prior therapy can sometimes help you understand how they're going to respond to a future therapy, um, where their cancer is, you know, is it visceral, non-visceral, and what biomarkers they have, um, if, what germline uh, genetic mutations they have. And so really putting all the pieces together help us better understand how to tailor treatment to the individual patient. So we will have some cases uh, that we'll discuss, which I think is really helpful to put everything into context. Definitely. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about all of these topics during the webinar. Um, so thank you so much for coming on today. This is a really great preview, and I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about it. Thank you so much for having me. Great. And for everybody listening, um, if you're interested in attending the webinar next week, uh, visit i3health.com. Um, and the webinar is Wednesday, July 12th at 1 p.m. Um, so if you visit the website, you can learn more and register. Thank you again. Thank you.